Life in my house has started to become twisted as of a few months ago. The amount of strange and psychotic incidents I have dealt with seem to grow by the day. My six-year-old daughter, Brandy, used to be a heavy sleeper before all this started. She would fall asleep on the couch while watching TV, and I would often end up carrying her to her bed. Lately, she never sleeps. Every time I wake up in the master bedroom, I'd catch a glimpse of a small face peeking through the door, silently disappearing into the shadows of the house, unrestrained glee on that small face. My wife had the most severe personality change of all. She wasn't the woman that I married. All the warmth, compassion, and humanity had suddenly disappeared, leaving some monstrous shell behind. Like my daughter, she never seemed to sleep anymore. She would disappear into the dark forest behind the house at night, wandering in her nightgown, barefoot, like a pale ghost, disappearing into the mist. One night, I remember waking up from a nightmare. The bathroom light dimly illuminated the master bedroom where I slept. I turned to my wife and found her already awake, staring at me with an insane expression, her eyes bulging out of their sockets. A wide, lunatic grin spread across her face. I sat straight up in bed, my heart palpitating with fear. Is something wrong? I asked. But she continued to stare at me with that inhuman expression, her eyes gleaming. Emma, are you okay? I felt something wet and sticky soaking into my t-shirt. I looked down on the bed and saw a freshly killed possum laying between us. Its head twisted around, its torso sliced down the middle. Intestines spilled out onto the sheet, staining them. The smell of blood and death hit me all at once, and I jumped out of bed without another word, grabbing new clothes and running to the bathroom. I locked myself in, hyperventilating for a few minutes. Once I managed to calm down some, I checked the lock again and stripped off and took a long shower, wiping the blood off my skin. No matter how much soap I used, though, I still felt stained. When I was done, I opened the door a tiny crack and peered through. The bedroom looked empty. I had no idea where my wife was, and I didn't really care. I quickly ran to the guest bedroom, locking the door behind me, and for the last couple of months I've slept there every night, a can of mace on the nightstand next to my bed, a brand new deadbolt on the door. The next morning I met my friend Richie at the local diner. I called out sick from work, and as I sat in the booth waiting for him to arrive, my hands shook uncontrollably. I spilled coffee on the table, and on myself more than a few times. I hadn't slept since the incident, and was only running on a couple of hours. I saw him arrive, striding through the front door, wearing a t-shirt to show off the tattoos on his arms. With his dirty blonde hair and blue eyes, he had a very Irish cast to his face. He sat down across from me, looking me up and down and quickly frowning. He saw all the spill marks on the table, the napkins I'd used to half-acidly clean it up, my trembling hands and sunken, tired eyes. I'm sure I was quite a sight. What's up, Thorn? he asked, not smiling. Like a lot of my friends, he always calls me by my last name rather than Julius. I shook my head. I don't know, man. Some weird stuff's going on. Like, like really weird. I'm scared. I really am. He nodded. Yeah, I can tell. You know, I'm always here for you. Whatever you need... Just call me. Thanks, I said, trying to smile. Now, why don't you tell me what's going on? I'm all ears. Tell me everything. Maybe we can figure something out. At that moment, the waitress came, taking orders and bringing Richie some coffee. Once she was gone, I, I told him everything that had happened. I didn't leave out a single detail. By the time I was done, our breakfast had arrived, and we were both on a third cup of coffee. I still felt drained. The caffeine seemed to make me feel more tired, if anything. Hmm, Richie said thoughtfully, eating a piece of bacon. He stared across the room, his eyes looking a thousand miles away. 
That's weird. I think it's more than weird. It's it's psychotic. I'm scared to go home. I'm scared to be in the same room with my own wife and daughter. Yeah, he said, nodding, as he chugged the rest of his burning hot coffee in one long swallow. It is. Psychotic, I mean. What do you think is happening? The question caught me by surprise, and I choked a little on my coffee. Me? I've got no idea what's happening. All I know is my wife and daughter have turned into lunatics. If it was just one of them acting weird, maybe I'd think it was mental illness, schizophrenia or something. He smiled slightly at that, but his eyes remained grave. I think the seriousness with which he took the situation freaked me out as much as the situation itself. But it's not one, it's both. And yet, not you. You seem totally fine. What's your point? I asked. Well, if it's some sort of strange drug in the water, all three of you would be affected. You all eat and drink the same stuff, right? And if it was mental illness, likely it would only be one of your family members. I mean, what are the chances that two people would develop a serious psychotic disorder at the same time, right? Schizophrenia is extremely rare in children anyway. So what does that leave, I asked. He shrugged. I don't know. Maybe body snatchers or aliens or mad scientists cloning people in a secret government experiment? Who the hell knows? I laughed at that. Hearing it put into words made it sound totally insane. Aliens? Body snatchers, I said. That's all science fiction crap. This is real, man. It's real and I don't know what to do should leave your house immediately. You can stay with me for a few days, Richie said. I shook my head. I can't just leave my family behind. Realizing how feeble an argument that was, I had just said these people weren't my family after all. But Richie understood. You mean you can't leave until you find out what might have happened? He asked. My head slumped, all the tiredness and fear from the past week leaving me lethargic and bone-tired. I can't just leave, I said again, feeling for all the world like a prisoner. Things began to get strange after that. Pets began to disappear all across the neighborhood, and I'd see signs for missing dogs and cats up and down the block. Normally, Emma would have become despondent over this. She was an animal lover who often donated to charities for homeless people or abandoned pets, she had an ASPCA sticker on her car, but as I had known from the start of all this, there was no Emma living in my house anymore. During the first days, I thought maybe some toxin in the food or water had caused brain damage or personality changes in my family. Maybe it was an intentional release of some chemical weapon by the government or a terrorist group. All those thoughts passed through my head, but my intuition told me over and over that these were dead ends or red herrings. The truth was, these people weren't my family. I knew it in my heart from the very beginning. I could see it in the way their eyes gleamed during the night as they crept around the house, never sleeping, moving as silently as cats stalking prey. I would hear floorboards creak outside the door as one or maybe both of them stood there for hours on end in the middle of the night. My heart would begin to beat faster. Dark bags began to form under my eyes as I slept less and less. The only release I had was work, but every night I'd come back to these people I didn't know, but who looked identical to my family. I lost weight from the stress and began to smoke heavily. Normally, Emma hated it when I smoked, and she never allowed it in the house. Now I chain-smoked inside, and she didn't even notice. She and Brandy barely talked anymore, even to each other. When they did speak... Their sentences were short, clipped, and bizarre. A month ago, I was sitting in the guest bedroom, smoking and reading some Philip K. Dick. I had the three stigmas of Palmer Eldritch in my hand, which, ironically, was a story about a man who's been replaced by an advanced alien civilization. It struck a little too close to home, and I put it down, just staring out the window. The dim lamp I kept on through the night, giving the room a yellow glow. That's when I saw her. My wife was 
creeping out the basement door barefoot, an insane smile plastered across her face. Her eyes looked around. She looked like a maniac who's trying to keep herself from descending into uncontrollable laughter. I wonder what she finds so amusing, I whispered to myself bitterly, feeling cold hatred and spite towards these two strange people who had taken over my house. I saw her start towards the woods behind the house, taking a small dirt trail that ran towards a nature preserve a mile away. At that moment, totally fed up and ready for this madness to be at an end, I resolved to follow her. I got up out of bed, wincing as the springs groaned. I wondered if my daughter would be waiting outside the door with a knife in her hand, ready to cut me open like my wife did to that poor possum. I heard a floorboard creak directly outside my door, and a slight, barely audible sound follow it. it sounded like giggling, a little girl quietly laughing, and I swore under my breath. To hell with it, I whispered, going to the window and opening it. The wood shrieked loudly, and I winced, looking back over at the door. There was no response from the other side, though. You're afraid of a little girl finding out that you're leaving? You're a grown man, I told myself, smiling at the absurdity of it. But when I remembered Brandy's cold, insane eyes, the smile went away. Yeah, I was afraid of that little girl. I had no idea what she was capable of. I looked down, and it was only a second-story drop. Below the window was soft earth and grass. I slowly climbed out, hanging myself from the window and letting myself fall. I felt myself fall for a few moments and wondered if I would regret it. Images of my leg bones breaking and poking out through the skin ran through my head, and when I hit the ground, I rolled and hit the dirt. I landed hard on my back, knocking the wind out of my lungs. I lay there for a few seconds, breathing hard, then pushed myself up and began to follow my wife. I was wearing only slippers and boxers and a t-shirt wasn't exactly dressed for reconnaissance work, but then again, neither was she. I glanced at the house, and from my daughter's window, I thought I saw a small face staring down at me, grinning like a jack-o'-lantern. An expression of barely contained glee and bloodlust marred her childish face, but when I looked back up, the window was empty. I figured my mind was playing tricks on me, but it still shook me badly. I had never imagined I would be so afraid of a little girl as I was right then. I tried to move as fast as I could without making a sound, hoping I could catch up with my wife. The half moon gave me some bare light that streamed through the trees. I used it to avoid the rocks and tree roots that jutted out of the earth. After a few minutes, I heard an eerie sound coming from in front of me. It was humming. I caught a glimpse of my wife, pale and white, her nightgown billowing around her thin frame. She stared straight ahead, her eyes not seeming to blink. She veered off the trail and I followed from a safe distance, trying to keep myself hidden behind the trees. It felt like dozens of eyes watched my every movement, but I brushed it off as paranoia. She trampled through brush and pricker bushes, not seeming to notice the thorns and whipping branches. I tried to avoid the obstacles while still keeping her in view. We went uphill for a while, and to me, her choice of direction seemed totally random. Then she stopped, the humming cutting off mid-note, and she knelt down, sighing in pleasure. She began to play with something white lying on the ground under a small pile of leaves and brush. She carefully brushed the remnants of the disintegrated leaves and soil off the object. From behind the tree, I couldn't see what it was. She ran it through her fingers, stroking it lovingly, even kissing it. After what I felt like was an eternity, she put it back down, turning around to start back towards the house. She passed within 20 feet of me, and I hid behind the largest tree in the immediate area, moving behind the trunk as she passed and praying that no twigs would snap and give me away. None did, and... I watched her descend into the fog and trees. As soon as I was sure she was gone, I crept towards the spot that I'd seen her crouch. A bone lay there, thin and long, 
still covered in a piece of rotting flesh. In horror, I knelt down, examining it closer. It looked too large to be an animal bone, though perhaps it could have come from a deer. Underneath, I saw the earth had been recently disturbed. It looked as if it had been dug up and filled back in again. I went back to the house and grabbed a shovel from the shed, determined to solve the mystery. The dark house loomed over me, the windows looking down on me like pupils, hiding what lay behind them. When I got back to the site of the bone, I started digging. The earth was soft and fresh, and it didn't take long to get a large hole started. But I found nothing in the first half hour. Covered in sweat and breathing heavily, I took a breath, then went back to the task. Once I'd gotten down about five feet, I saw something besides dirt and small stones. At first I couldn't tell what it was, but it emanated a fluorescent day-glow color. Then with horror, I realized it was my daughter's favorite t-shirt. I kept pulling dirt off and soon found two bodies in the pit. It was Emma and Brandy, their throats cut wide open, their staring eyes covered in earth. I turned and vomited on the forest floor, feeling I might collapse at any moment. Waves of hopelessness, confusion, and anger consumed me in turn. Staggering, I ran out of the woods, going to a neighbor's house and frantically knocking on the door. It was 3 a.m. and it took a while to get a response. Finally, my neighbor, an old retired guy, came to the door. Al, thank God, I said. His tired, bloodshot eyes looked at me for a long time. Julius, it's a bit late for a visit, he said. It's an emergency. Can I use your phone for a minute? I need the police here immediately. His eyes widened at first, and he looked wide awake a moment later. Sure, sure, c come on in. As soon as I entered, he closed and locked the door behind me. He pointed towards the kitchen. Phone's in there, hanging on the wall next to the door. I thanked him profusely, visions of my murdered family members running through my head. Then I dialed the police, my fingers shaking so badly that it took me a few tries. Finally, though, I heard it began to ring, and at that moment, I wondered what exactly I would say. The 911 operator assured me that vehicles were en route, and that I should stay at the house with my neighbor, Al, until they made sure the area was safe. Under no circumstances should I go outside until the police arrived. It all sounded normal and sensible at the time, and I had no suspicion that things would become nightmarish and lethal within minutes. Al had listened to me frantically trying to describe the situation to the 911 operator with wide eyes, his wrinkled old face showing fear and confusion. He had a cup of coffee in his hand, but I never saw him drink any of it. Is that true? He asked after I hung up. Brandy and Emma are dead? You found their bodies in the woods? I nodded grimly. I hadn't told the 911 operator about the doppelgangers in the house or the bizarre and psychotic behavior. I figured once the police saw the bodies, the story would become a little more believable, and I didn't want to sound like a lunatic over the phone. Let the police come and think that I was some delusional maniac who had just murdered my own family and I was trying to cover my ass by calling and reporting it. I had watched enough true crime shows to know that whenever a wife or a husband is murdered, the spouse is always the first suspect until cleared by forensic evidence or an alibi. Seemed like no time had passed when I heard tires screeching outside and vehicles pulling up in a frenzy. I looked outside expecting to see the police lights flashing, wondering why no sirens had sounded. My heart leapt in my throat when I saw three black SUVs filled with men in suits. They leapt out holding automatic rifles and, without warning, they pointed the guns at the house and began firing. Fifteen dark silhouettes lined up down the street outside, looking like a firing squad at a military execution. When the first bullet exploded through the wall, I was so surprised that I didn't even move. I saw Al standing there with his mouth hanging open as a bullet shattered his coffee cup, sending the steaming hot liquid all over the floor, but missing his hand entirely. A second later, another one came in and exploded through his chest. 
In slow motion, I saw a flower of blood blossom out of the gaping hole that suddenly appeared in the center of his heart. He didn't so much as cry out, but instead fell back instantly, moving his hands up as if in supplication as he clenched and unclenched his fingers. His mouth opened and closed slightly as a puddle of blood rapidly spread out beneath him on the linoleum floor. Then, my instincts kicked in. As glass shattered and dishes exploded, light bulbs bursting all around me, I jumped to the floor, crawling towards the back door, making myself as small a target as possible. At that moment, I didn't even realize I dragged myself through the warm, sticky mess pooling beneath Al's still body. His pupils dilated in death and his mouth opened in surprise. The blood completely covered my white shirt and blue jeans. I dragged my arms and hands through it as light after light went out, each bulb exploding in turn as gunfire strafed across the house over and over, left to right, right to left, then left to right again. After what felt like an eternity, the shooting stopped. I'd finally reached the back door at that point. I also looked like a serial killer with my clothing, shoes, and skin, mostly covered by Al's blood. It made me feel sick to my stomach, and a part of me wanted to rip the soiled clothes off and throw them outside as I went. I jumped up, flinging the door open and running out into the dark night beyond. Behind me, I heard the front door smash open as the man kicked his way inside. The last thing I heard from that house was them running from room to room yelling clear. Then I reached the border of the forest and I was swallowed up in shadows. As I wandered blindly through the trees, covered in goosebumps and sweating heavily, I heard the men destroying the back door of the house. They had apparently cleared the house and realized I was no longer inside. Reality felt like a nightmare, disoriented and surreal. I couldn't believe any of this was happening, but my instincts took over and, with the high amount of adrenaline surging through my blood, I ran like I'd never run before. The men began to come out into the forest sprinting, turning on little LED lights attached to the end of their rifles. I had the advantage and that I knew the woods better than they did. The men certainly had me beat on physical strength and stamina, though. They all looked like gym rats, their muscles bulging under their black suits, their thick bodies striding forward with purpose. They all stood tall and still for a moment as their cold killer's eyes surveyed the surroundings, reptilian, and emotionless. I heard more SUVs coming to a screeching halt in front of my house, and soon the sounds of many dogs barking echoed across the forest. I knew they were tracking me, knew they'd find me and kill me. No one would ever know what had happened here, least of all me, and no one would ever be able to prevent it from happening again with the destruction of the sole living witness to this bizarre replacement of my family. I ran towards a large rock formation I knew nearby, with small indentions allowing a man to fit in the wide cracks of the 30-foot-tall cylinder of stone. This was a place I liked to come and sit during happier times, sometimes just meditating and listening to the sound of birds and breathing in the clean air of the woods. Now, I hoped in my time of desperation that it would come to my aid again. I heard the dogs getting closer and saw the lights separating into smaller and smaller groups as the agents combed every inch of the woods, sweeping their rifles up and down and left and right as they looked in every crevice and behind every tree. I saw a single light drawn near me. My heart seemed to stop. I knelt down low, feeling the ground with my trembling fingers. I found a large flat stone that must have weighed a good ten pounds. Making myself as small a target as possible, I waited for the figure to pass right by my hiding spot. Even though this happened a couple of months ago now, I still remember the rising waves of anxiety that gripped my heart as this assassin stood before me. As soon as the light began to turn to examine the dark corner of the indention, I sprang forward, waves of adrenaline giving me amazing strength and reflexes. The man saw me at the last moment, his eyes widening as his fingers began to tighten on the trigger. As I smashed his skull in with the rock, his neck twisted to the side, his eyes instantly dropping 
as his body went slack. I dropped the rock onto the leaf-strewn ground and caught him in the same movement, dragging his limp body back into the shadowy groove of the rock where I hid. I took the automatic rifle off of him, flicked off the light, and felt around on his belt for extra ammunition. I found three little clips. I fumbled around until I found the latch to release the magazines, unclipping them one after another and shoving them into my pockets. The man quickly started to stir, groaning and moving his head slowly from side to side, his eyes still clenched shut. Oh, oh, my head. Jesus, what? His blue eyes suddenly opened, and he looked directly at me, an icy hatred changing his expression in a single moment. It's you, Julius Thorne. He spat my name like venom, staring directly at me. Even his blood trickled down his cheeks and forehead. Yeah, it's me. The hell is going on right now. Why did you psychopaths murder my neighbor and try to kill me? He just shook his head and kept his mouth tightly shut. I waited a few seconds, giving him a chance to answer. When I realized he wasn't planning on talking, I sighted, stealing myself for what I knew I had to do. Raising the rifle up above my head, I quickly brought the butt of the gun down into the center of his nose. I heard it crunch, a fountain of blood exploding from the front of his face. He started to open his mouth to scream, but I turned the gun around and pointed it straight into his right eye. If you scream, I'll kill you right here. I have nothing to lose right now, and I'd rather go down fighting. He bit his lip so deeply that a small trickle of blood began to stream down his chin, but he didn't scream or cry out, despite the immense pain he looked to be in. Now, maybe we can try again. Why did you guys want to kill me? Why are you chasing me? We're agents who are tasked with detecting and destroying anomalies that have arisen across the United States, he said, scowling at me with hatred, his words coming out somewhat distorted as he constantly spat blood. People usually call us the cleaners. Mostly we deal with incidents in small towns like this one, though sometimes shit hits the fan in big cities too. Hell, just last week we had a werewolf in New York. Press thought it was some serial killer who ripped apart his victims with a knife, but any coroner worth his salt would know immediately what he was looking at. But we found him and brought him in for containment. He had already killed three joggers and seven homeless people by then. Yeah? What does that have to do with me? I asked furiously. I hated these men so badly at that moment. I had asked for help, and instead, assassins had come to my side. Your wife and daughter are dead, but you're not the first one to call to say you found graves in the forest. In every other case, the police found the people still alive and healthy in the house, and the graves are totally empty by the time we got there. But there were always indications that the individual still living had changed. They always began to show psychotic and violent behavior, and inevitably, they would kill their own family members, neighbors, hell, anyone in the area. When the anomaly is allowed to proceed, the entire town often ends up being destroyed. We lost over 10,000 people in a single incident last year, so we come in and contain it by killing anyone associated with the anomaly, stop it from spreading. Because it does spread, and it seems to spread by association. It started with a couple of people on the street, then the rest of their house, then their next-door neighbors. It keeps going outward like ripples spreading through a pond. By this point, I heard dogs getting closer and closer. I saw lights flashing through the trees in the distance, aimed in my direction. I quickly ripped the strip of fabric from the agent's shirt and tied his hands and feet before binding his mouth so he couldn't scream. I knew they'd still probably find him within about ten minutes, so that might be all I needed to get out of here. Now, at least I had a gun. I sprinted out into the woods, taking the trail in the opposite direction of the agents. I had to move in the dark, which slowed me down significantly, but I'd been on these trails a thousand times before. Soon, the shouting of men and the barking of dogs grew fainter behind me. 
and I came out on an empty roadside. I knew the area well. Richie lived only a few blocks from me. Without thinking, I began to stagger down the road. The street lights flashed on and off before me. I saw faces peering out the windows as I passed. I must have looked like a madman, being totally covered in blood with wide, panicked eyes that constantly snapped in the direction of the smallest sound. Yet amazingly, not a single person came out of their house. I wondered how many of the faces were just those who were replaced doppelgangers with the right human skin, but without any real human mind, except maybe for its most destructive and insane impulse. Within minutes, I found myself stumbling through Richie's front yard towards his little ranch house, a massive wraparound porch with pillars painted white in front of the light blue siding. He had Halloween decorations all over the place. Scarecrows were crucified in the front yard, fake blood streaming from their hands and feet, a massive painting of a reptilian humanoid with black shining eyes and tentacles coming out of its mouth stood in front of the porch like some nightmare from an H.P. Lovecraft story. Fake gravestones were lined up, row after row of gray foam with skeleton hands rising from the grass in front of them. I saw a plume of smoke rising from a chimney connected to the fireplace, the smell of wood smoke and decaying autumn leaves mixing with a pleasant scent that always reminded me of Halloween. I pounded on the door until Richie came and opened it, his eyes widening as he saw me. Holy crap, Thorn! What happened? he asked. I pushed past him, looking back furtively at the street and the dark forest stretching out before us. Hidden dangers seemed to be everywhere. Close the door, I told him. He quickly shut it and turned the deadbolt. He turned to me, his face pale, a shocked expression. Are you... are you hurt? Whose blood is that? Is it yours? No, I said curtly, shaking my head. I don't have time to explain it all now. Some men are after me. I... I think they're from the government. My neighbor's dead. My family's dead. I... I broke it down for him, crying. I need help. I really, really need help right now. Okay, okay, I, I believe you, he said reassuringly, putting a hand on my shoulder. It's gonna be okay. It's a nice gun, by the way, he said, giving me a calming smile. I'd clearly forgotten about the automatic rifle slung over my shoulder. I looked down at it with a blank expression, as if I had just discovered a new limb on my body. Hey, how about we get you a change of clothes, and then we'll figure out what to do. Come with me to my room. I think you're about my size. I gratefully followed him. He gave me an old t-shirt and a hoodie and a pair of jeans. I stripped off my bloody clothes, feeling how the drying, coagulating blood cracked under my dirt-stained fingers as I took them off. I felt a small sense of hope as I put on the clean clothes. I had my friend here with me now. I'd escaped. I wasn't alone in this anymore. At that moment, I heard a knock at the front door. It sounded light and hesitant, like the knocking of a small child. I walked quickly out of the room and saw Richie standing there, the front door standing wide open, a nightmarish shape standing on the porch. It looked like a person, but deep, blackened burns covered every inch of its skin. Only the eyes still had humanity left, two shining pits of despair with green irises and massively dilated pupils. They constantly teared up and rolled from side to side in agony. The person held out their arm in front of them as if there were so much pain that they didn't even want their arm to touch their body. I couldn't tell the race or the gender of the person through the immense damage to their body. Yellowish fluid mixed with the bright trails of blood seeping from the cracks of their destroyed skin. It constantly moaned, the weeping wounds all over its body crying constantly, and the smell of smoke and gasoline radiated off the dying person on the porch. Ugh! Oh, God! Help! Please! My God! Richie said, putting his hand to his mouth. Jesus, we, we need an ambulance here immediately. He furiously checked his pockets, then he spun, his eyes blind with panic. My phone's upstairs. We, we need to call 911 right away. No, oh, Richie, I screamed. When I called 911, the men came and tried to kill me. They're, they're not on our side. I wished I had more time to explain. Richie heard the note of panic in my voice, 
His face was covered in a sheen of sweat, and the anxiety I felt seemed reflected in his expression. Well, well, we have to do something, he said, a pleading tone in his voice. He looked like he wanted to turn and run away from the whole situation. Then he stopped and stared at the figure more closely. Oh, God, is that you, Melissa? With those words, my heart jumped in my throat. I turned to the figure with newfound horror. Melissa and Richie had dated for nearly a year. Looking close at the figure, I could see that it did appear to be a woman, at least as far as I could tell, from the curve of its body under the blackened skin. Melissa was white and thin, about five foot six. This thing with third degree burns all over its body was certainly the right height and build. It hurts, she said, her voice gurgling and loud. It hurts, it hurts so bad. Kill me, please kill me. She waved her arms as if trying to cool with the crisp autumn air. That's it, I'm, I'm calling an ambulance, Richie said, running past me. I followed closely behind him, leaving the door wide open. We went upstairs. He pulled his phone from the charger and opened it, dialing 911. He frowned, listening for what seemed like a long time. Then he gave me the phone. As I listened to it, my ears heard an emotionless message read by a robot with a woman's voice coming through. Stay in your homes until the situation is resolved. Thank you for your help in these trying times. Then it began to repeat, starting at the beginning. This is a recording. Emergency services in your area have been temporarily suspended. Help is on the way. Under Executive Order 718, martial law has been declared in your area. Until it arrives, please keep your doors locked and your windows closed. Stay in your home until the situation is resolved. What... what is this? Richie said, infuriated. What do they mean emergency services are temporarily suspended? Why... why don't we just take her straight to the hospital, I asked. His eyes brightened at that. Yeah, yeah, let's do that. What, what other choice do we have? She needs help immediately. She, she's going to die without it, he said gloomily, his eyes growing moist. But the phone says to stay inside. I really hate to say it, but I think she's going to die regardless. No one can survive third-degree burns over the vast majority of their body. We moved back downstairs, the phone in Richie's hand. As we came down, we realized the front door was still open. Melissa was gone. I ran forward, seeing blood drops and pus on the deck where she had stood, yet there was no sign of her. Where could she have gone? She couldn't have walked far in her condition. I was amazed that she was still conscious at all. She must have been in the worst pain imaginable. I saw a figure walking up the porch stairs. I sighed, thinking Melissa had come back, and she had in a way. She stood before us now, fully healed, her clothes new and unburnt. She had an ear-to-ear -ear grin across her face, and she kept one hand behind her back. Richie, she said slowly, as if tasting the word. Oh, Richie, I'm so happy to see you. A lot of strange things have happened tonight. Richie's eyes glistened as tears began to slide down his face. Melissa, oh my God, it's really you, isn't it? Of course it is, baby, she said, moving a lock of blonde hair off her face with her left hand. Her right stayed behind her back. She talked like Melissa. She even seemed to have some of her mannerisms. But in her wide, staring eyes, there was a look of bloodlust and lunacy. Richie, stay back, I said. That's not Melissa. But he ran forward, crying, his arms outstretched. I don't even know if he heard what I'd said. When he crossed the threshold of the door, Melissa pulled her hands from behind her back, revealing a huge, blood-stained butcher's knife. Raising it high, she ran forward, her eyes as cold as the vast, empty space between worlds. My hands reacted without my brain even comprehending what we were doing, raising the gun high and pointing it at her chest. I saw the knife coming down as if in slow motion, then thick drops of blood splashing in the air as the bullet ripped through her stomach and heart. She jerked backwards, the knife rising back up as her arm spasmed. Stumbling, she stepped forward, futilely slashing at the air six inches in front of Richie's neck, 
with all her strength before falling face first onto the porch. Richie hadn't even reacted as the knife whizzed in the air towards his body. He stood shell-shocked and dazed like a victim from a war zone. So did I, except with a smoking gun in my hand. Screaming began to emanate all up and down the street as people started running out of their houses. For a couple of seconds, I thought everyone had simply reacted to the sounds of gunfire. Perhaps some of them had even seen me kill Melissa, though if they had, they would have known my actions were clearly taken in self-defense. She was clutching a knife tightly in her right hand, her eyes bulging from their sockets, the maniac grin eternally etched across her thin, pretty face in a grisly death mask. I quickly realized the other people on the street were not coming out to investigate the gunshots, but instead running for their lives. I also saw men, women, even children, chased by family members wielding knives, axes, and guns. Across the street from Richie's house, I saw a little girl, no older than ten, running in her bright yellow SpongeBob pajamas. The mother, an overweight woman with pendulous breasts and greasy black hair, held a blood-stained samurai sword above her head, breathing heavily as she sprinted after her daughter with murder in her eyes. Under the harsh glare of the streetlights, she looked surreal, like a villain from a cartoon. Mommy, no, the girl shrieked, flailing her arms in front of her as she ran, as if hoping an invisible guardian angel would grab her up and carry her away. Daddy, help me. But I had a feeling her dad wasn't coming, based on the amount of blood already on the murder weapon. Richie and I began to run towards the girl, but the mother closed the distance quickly, her nightgown flying furiously around her waist. Her eyes wild, a twisted grin marring her pale face. She raised the sword and brought it down into the back of one of the girl's legs. With a squeal of agony, the girl fell forward, her pajamas quickly turning crimson with the blood streaming down her leg. She began to crawl away, weeping and shrieking for her father. Behind her, the mother raised the sword again, intending to strike a killing blow. With the girl on the ground, I had a clear shot now. I'd been tempted to try to take it earlier, but the girl had stood right between her mother and I, and I feared that I would kill them both if I fired. Now I had the mother right in my sights, the lunatic gleam in her dark eyes making her seem somehow inhuman, even alien. I squeezed the trigger, watching her head explode in a shower of hair and skin and bone splinters, as a short burst of three or four bullets exploded at the end of the barrel. Her headless body stood there for a few minutes, holding the bloody sword high, the neurons still firing in a body that hadn't realized it had lost its life yet. She staggered forward, falling towards her daughter, the spurting stump of her neck soaking the girl in the mother's blood. The girl continued to crawl away from this nightmarish figure that had once been her mom. Running forward, Richie grabbed the girl, carefully lifting her up behind her knee and shoulders, I covered them as the mayhem broke out up and down the street, continuously moving the barrel of the automatic rifle in the direction of the nearby sounds, ready to fire at a moment's notice. Most of the creatures were sparse, a few hundred feet away, but the thick forest was stretched out behind them for miles. Further down the street, I saw chaos and bloodshed as deranged family members murdered their sons and daughters, their mothers and fathers littering the streets with corpses. Pain-filled screams shattered the silence of the night, echoing and distorting as they mixed into a nightmarish cacophony. Even months later, I still hear them while I'm falling asleep, the horror-filled cries of children in their last moments. We ignored the bloodshed and ran back towards the house. The girl's blood dripped all over Richie's arm. She moaned and kept rolling her head, eventually letting it settle against his chest. Then she went quiet, her eyes closing, a peaceful look coming over her face. We ran through the open house. Richie took the girl into the kitchen, putting her on the table. I stayed behind, locking the door before I also engaged the deadbolt. I turned around, assessing the damage. The girl's eyes started to close as Richie took off her pajama bottoms. We both had college degrees and a great deal of theoretical knowledge on many subjects, but neither of us had any real experience with assessing or dressing wounds. 
I took out my phone, instinctively going to YouTube to type, how do I give someone stitches? But I noticed my internet didn't work. My phone calls and text messages refused to go through. Apparently, they had taken down all the cell towers, as well as revoking emergency services. Okay, we have no internet, so we're going to have to do this blind. I don't think it's that difficult. I think you know more about this than I do, Richie said. You always loved anatomy and dissection and all that. I nodded grimly. I went and washed my hands while Richie grabbed a box of latex gloves from the kitchen drawer. I walked back to the girl and started to clean the area with paper towels, a bowl of water, and a clean rag setting next to the prone figure on the table. Soon, the water had turned a bright red as I used the rag to clean the blood off her skin. I could see the wound had not hit any vital areas. I saw no severed blood vessels spurting bright red arterial blood in time with her heartbeat, and the bleeding had already slowed. I sighed in relief at our small bit of luck. It looks like it's a lot worse than it is. The sword cut into the muscle somewhat, but it missed all the major arteries and veins in the area. She might have a hard time walking, but I think that as long as we clean and bandage it properly, she should be fine. Assuming she gets out of here alive, Richie pointed out. I nodded. We went and grabbed a sewing kit from the living room, something Melissa had left behind. From the garage, she got a length of fishing line. After sterilizing the needle and the line and cleaning the wound with alcohol, I threaded it and began to stitch the girl back together. The girl still lay on the table, catatonic and pale, as Richie and I sat in the living room, unsure of what to do next waiting for her to wake up from that cathartic state. You know what I think, Richie said. No, but I'm sure you're going to tell me, I said, glancing out the window. Richie's eyes gleamed, his hands shaking. I couldn't tell if it was terror or excitement. You know how the Bible sounds totally nuts, at least the Old Testament does, where they talk about how all the women came from man's ribs and how there were only two people and everyone is descendant from their children's incestuous couplings i nodded this was a topic richie had gone on at length before i knew where he was going to try to steer the conversation and i sighed looking out the window again other than the dozens of bloody bodies strewn across the street everything looked idyllic just another peaceful night in a small american town yeah and you think it has something to do with aliens right i said he nodded quickly gesticulating crazily with his hands now I mean, yeah, I, I think about it. A woman coming from a man's rib? That doesn't even make sense. Unless it was some sort of genetic engineering. Perhaps they wanted his bone marrow for its DNA. You don't need to take out someone's rib to get their DNA, I retorted. You can literally get DNA from any part of their body, except the red blood cells, of course. He looked at me quizzically. I forgot just how much you know off the top of your head sometimes. Why not the red blood cells? Because they lose the nucleus when the progenitor cell creates them. So they have no DNA and no nucleus. Thought I saw a shadow flicker across the street, but when I turned my head, I saw just shadows. A flag waved lazily in the front yard. Well, anyway, they, they might have had a reason for using the bone marrow for genetic engineering. Why do you think Adam and Eve's great-grandchildren weren't deformed mutants or babbling idiots? Richie asked. I don't know. You tell me. I'm assuming it's because the story is a load of bullshit. He smiled at this. Because the kids were genetically engineered too. Probably the grandkids and so on. The aliens likely kept changing each individual's genetic code so these few people could reproduce with their own siblings without harmful effects. They probably engineered all the different races too. They made the two genders, so why not? Richie explained enthusiastically. I had to give him credit. The whole idea made sense in a weird kind of way. And another weird thing, Richie said, is that you could make a woman from a man, but not a man from a woman. To make a woman, you need a man's DNA. All you need is to remove the Y chromosome and duplicate the X chromosome, right? But you can't make a man from a woman's DNA because the Y chromosome would be entirely missing. The Y chromosome would be so synthetically engineered from the nucleotides, which would pose a huge problem, much harder than just replicating the X chromosome. There's no way that people who wrote the Bible could have known that. 
I think what's going on now is just demonic, I replied. Aliens wouldn't come all this way here just to take a random monkey and engineer it into a human species. And they wouldn't care about replacing people. What kind of sense would that make? But in hindsight, even though both of us were wrong, I think Richie was much closer to the truth. The girl woke up about 15 minutes later. I heard her moaning from the living room. Turning away from the window, where I'd kept a constant watch, I saw her rising on the table, her small face a mask of pain and confusion. Where am I? You're just across the street from your house. We brought you inside, I told her. Where's my dad? I just shook my head. I haven't seen any living people on the street in over 20 minutes. If your dad's alive, then he must have left. There are probably people hiding in the woods until things cool down, I replied. In truth, I thought there was no chance that her father was still alive. I walked over to the girl and put a hand on her shoulder. She flinched, her dark hair falling over her face as she pulled away. I'm not going to hurt you. My name's Julius, and my friend's name is Richie. You already know Richie, though, right? I've seen him a few times, mowing the lawn and stuff, but I don't really know him. Well, he's one of the good guys, and so am I. That's why we brought you inside and bandaged your leg. I even gave you stitches, though I don't know how professional they look. They'll do the job until we can get you to a hospital, though, I think. My name's Alice, she said, smiling, red spots rising on her cheeks. Thanks, I guess, but do you know... At that moment, the lights flickered, then came back to life for a moment, and then died again. Damn, I said. Richie sprang up from the couch, navigating his way through the dark to the kitchen. I heard him shuffling through the drawers, and then he pulled out two flashlights. He turned them on, and then began to walk over to give me the other one. No need, I said, turning the attached light on my rifle on. Its LED looked close to blinding, much brighter than Richie's two flashlights. He turned and gave the other one to Alice. Thanks, she said shyly, turning it on. I went back to the window, deciding to check and see if there was any movement yet. With the street lights out, I could barely see anything. I shone my light through the window and screamed when I saw a face standing inches from the other side of the window, grinning. Strange white tentacles covered the area where its eyes should have been, writhing and undulating, thick with slime and blood. Underneath it, I could see the face splitting in two as its grin spread even wider, separating except for five inches of bone and glistening muscle at the back. Hundreds of sharp serrated teeth gleamed in the light. Its body looked skinned and wet with blood that dripped from its bony fingers. It closed its mouth, the flesh coming together without any lines or marks indicating where it separated, and it gurgled as it spoke. The experiment is nearly complete. We'll keep the strong alive. In the end, you'll stand alone, and to us, you will return. Don't be afraid. We'll make the strong eternal. Why are you doing this? I screamed, my fingers tightening on the trigger. I wanted to blow apart this monstrosity, but something inside me told me to hold my fire. I had a feeling that he had not come alone, and if I started shooting, I might force them to invade the house and attack us. You have three hours until the end of the experiment, it said, turning to leave. It ignored my question. I watched the muscles on its skinless body contracting as it walked away, the huge tentacles sprouting from its head, constantly writhing like snakes. I saw the alien creature walk over to the woods on the other side of the street, where two more of its kind stood waiting, both naked and skinned. A man in a black robe with the hood pulled up over his face followed behind them as they disappeared into the shadows. I hadn't realized just how massive they were until a human form stood directly beside one. They towered over him, at least eight feet tall, with their tentacles stretched out far behind them. I turned to see Richie and Alice standing horror-struck in the kitchen. They were preparing some of the perishable food by flashlight, making ham sandwiches with cheese and lettuce, drinking milk and orange juice. I sat down, grabbing a sandwich and taking a bite. Well, Richie, I said through a mouthful of sandwich, I think you're right about the experiments on us. 
I don't know why or what they hope to accomplish, but something intelligent is clearly using us as guinea pigs. Did you hear what it said? What's going to happen in three hours? Is that when they plan to kill all of us, the survivors? They already wiped out most of the town, Alice said bitterly. They killed my mom. They killed my family too, I said. And I think we'll all be dead soon if we don't do something. We can't stay here. We gotta get out of town. We have to warn people what's happening here. You said those government goons already know about it, Richie said. Who else are we gonna have to warn? No one would believe us, not for a second. I barely believe us. I felt like I had been slapped. I hadn't thought about the man in black SUVs ever since we took Alice in. Where had they gone? Why weren't they here, tracking down people associated with the anomaly and shooting them? Unless they'd abandoned the town. Perhaps it had gone too far for such measures to be of any use. Perhaps this was why they had disabled 911 by the time I got to Richie's house. A shiver of fear ran through my body as I contemplated it. What about getting revenge for Melissa and your wife, he pointed at me, and your mother, he pointed at Alice. I laughed at that. Revenge? With what? The three magazines I have left for this rifle? You guys don't even have weapons, and she's just a ten-year-old girl. I want revenge just as much as anyone, but we have to focus on survival. Most of all, we have to focus on her surviving, I said, nodding towards Alice. We're the only people left who can help her get out of here alive. Richie was about to say something when shrieking started from outside. I heard a man yelling for his life. I ran to the window and saw someone banging on Alice's house across the street. Oh God, please help me, someone! When no one answered, he began running towards Richie's house. I figured he'd been doing this for a while, and when he saw the beam of my detachable light, his eyes widened. Oh, thank God, please let me in, they're right behind me. I looked at the man in wonder for a long moment. Then recognition came to me. It was the agent I'd ambushed in the woods. I could tell by the broken nose, the bloody mark on his forehead, the black suit, even his cold eyes. Without thinking, I ran to the hallway and flung the front door open. Come in. Stop yelling. You're going to attract everything within a ten-mile radius with that. Then I saw what was behind him, coming up the dark street, and my words caught in my throat. A dozen agents in black suits walked forward, bone-white tentacles whipping crazily around their heads. Their eyes were gone. The entire top of their heads had been replaced by those strange alien appendages. Below it, I saw their mouths gnashing constantly, biting the air with bloody serrated teeth. They were coming in our direction. Time to go, I yelled into the house. They had been preparing backpacks of food and water, and in a flash, we were out of the house. Alice gripped Richie's hand tightly as her small face contorted with fear at the sight of the agents. I had put in a fresh magazine after we got into the house. Aiming through the sights, I began to fire. My ears ringing as fire erupted from the barrel. Blood erupted from the chest and faces of the agents, the tentacles splitting apart and spewing black fluid on the pavement. Their high-pitched, animalistic shrieks echoed off the street as they ran forward in a blur. I remember seeing two of them fall, then four, then another couple stumbled as the gun clicked beneath my fingers. I'd gone through all thirty rounds, and it wasn't enough. Three of them still ran at us when a blinding light flashed above the trees. I heard a thwack, thwack, thwack sound as a powerful engine roared behind us. I looked up just in time to see a Black Hawk helicopter flying overhead. A man with a machine gun began firing mowing down all the remaining agents in a matter of moments. He turned the gun towards those crawling on the ground, still alive and with a flash of bullets. They stopped moving as well. Then, he slowly began to turn the gun on us. I had started to reload, slamming the magazine in as fast as I could. Without thinking, I raised it, looking through the sights and fired. As if in slow motion, I saw the man above me in the helicopter jerk before falling out of the side door. With a heavy thud, his body hit Richie's lawn. The helicopter kept flying and soon disappeared over the forest, the sound of its blades receding and then disappearing within seconds. I turned to Richie, seeing his sweaty, bloodshot eyes grow wide. 
The agent stood behind him, his face covered in blood. Richie still held Alice's hand, and the girl had her face pressed against his chest, silently crying. We really need to get out of here, I said, looking hard at the agent. I wondered how much he knew and how much he would tell me. Our bedraggled group, bloody and sore, injured and all, began walking as one towards the trail down the street, one that I knew ran through a nature reserve and came out at the next town over. And as I listened to the agent talk, I realized just how wrong I had been about everything happening in my town. The man said his name was Agent Kellerson, and what he told the group mostly lined up with what he had told me when I had ambushed and beaten him. Their secret government agency, which he would only call the cleaners, had been alerted to the presence of a potential anomaly in our little town. Whoever had alerted them had made it sound like it was only a couple of scattered cases of families being replaced, but when they arrived, they found the trickle had turned into a tsunami. Townspeople flooded 911 with calls around that time, until they had turned off the service and delivered a pre-recorded message announcing the emergency services were suspended. It didn't help that most of the police were themselves either replaced or being attacked by psychotic family members. So we began to contain and eliminate the anomaly by the only means available. Any time a 911 call alerted us to the presence of a potential replaced family, we would go and exterminate the group to prevent any further spread of the sickness throughout the community. Yet, it got to the point where nearly every house on every street had become compromised. We began having to go from house to house, still quickly alerted to any 911 calls in the meantime, until our agents became overwhelmed. That was when we found you hiding in your neighbor's house. We were ordered to eliminate you and your family immediately. We never got the chance to find your wife and daughter, though, due to circumstances that you already know. We had to put all our resources towards tracking you before you escaped, and potentially spread the contamination further. Then, we planned to come back and eliminate the doppelgangers. After you ambushed me and tied me up, though, I sat there waiting for about five minutes for the rest of the group to come in my direction and free me. Then I began to give up hope of them finding me quickly. I still heard them talking far away through the trees, but they'd stopped moving forward. I was able to shimmy towards the face of the cliff and rub the cloth bindings against a jagged piece of rock till I got my hands loose. By that point, I knew something had gone wrong with the rest of the group. For one, I could hear their screams echoing through the forest. I looked in their direction, dozens of bright LED lights still bouncing around crazily, sending chaotic shadows reaching out everywhere. Couldn't tell what the hell was going on. Heard my team leader yelling orders, trying to get people in line. Then the shooting started. All the guns started firing at once, spraying rounds in seconds. A blinding purple light shot out of the area, and instantly, everything was deathly silent. The agent went pale as he recalled this, walking next to us on the rocky trail that wound up a hill and down into the next town over, which was located in a valley. I snuck close to the chaos, trying to see what was happening without getting directly involved. I needed to see if I could figure out the source of the anomaly. I thought I might be able to report it to my superior. Then we could work to quickly eliminate it, you know, root and branch saw something in the ground, half buried, that stuck out and had strange silver and gold spires, as thin as silk, as if they'd been spun by some alien spider. They intertwined and interweaved in thin, tapering columns, no more than a few inches wide at the base, rising twenty feet above the ground. The agents all stood like zombies, not saying a word. They swayed slightly on their feet like plants blown in a light breeze. Their movements synchronized and eerie. It seemed like a single consciousness ran through them, controlling them like puppets. The purple light started up again, coming out in rippling waves. 
It moved out slowly, forming iridescent ripples and fractal patterns with grid-like energy that crawled through the trees and bushes. I saw the silver and gold spires also begin to light up, glowing as the purple light formed some strange sort of cyclone around the spires, spiraling up against them in a perfect circle. The mouths of all the agents dropped open at once as their flesh began to ripple and melt right before my eyes. I started to crawl away quickly, trying to make as little noise as possible. When I last looked back, I saw the tentacles growing out of their faces like parasites ripping their way out of someone's skin. So what happens now? Richie asked. What's the next step when all your agents on the ground are dead? Or worse? Well, according to military doctrine, if the first line of ground defense is removed, the next logical step is to take to the air. That's NATO doctrine, and the CIA and all other agencies generally follow the military principles outlined by the NATO generals and leaders. So we can expect airstrikes, I asked, horrified. He nodded. Helicopters with machine guns, airstrikes, artillery shells, everything. This place is going to be lit up soon. We want to be as far as possible from the center of town as we can get. In the past, they haven't hesitated to use biological or chemical weapons on an entire area. Hell, one time I remember our group was assigned to a town where the water supply got contaminated by some sort of alien fungus that transformed people into a hive mind. Most of the cleaners got wiped out on that one too, and nearly all the CIA agents as well. They ended up having to exterminate the whole area with nerve agents like sarin and cyclosarin until nothing was moving on the ground. The town is still blocked off by military roadblocks. They use the old line that a coal mine caught on fire underground, and It'll burn for decades, but everyone higher up in the government knows the truth. We had progressed far up the trail by this point, and I could see the entire town below us. Not a single light shone in any of the houses. No cars drove on the roads. The place looked eerie and abandoned. Occasionally, a scream of terror or pain would rip through the night, faint but clear. It echoed up to the tops of the hills and through the trees until it faded out to nothing. I saw multiple helicopters crisscrossing the skies. They used giant spotlights to sweep the roads and the fronts and backs of houses, looking for any sign of movement. Occasionally, automatic weapons fire would begin shrieking from above, a sign that they'd got another one through, whether they were murdering just doppelgangers or innocent civilians. I didn't know. I wasn't even sure... How many innocent civilians could still be alive after the chaos and bloodshed we'd seen? Based on the fact that the helicopter's machine gunner had started to target me before I killed him, I believe they were going around murdering anything that moved. Perhaps the anomaly had spread so fast that they thought they didn't have any options. As we took in the view under the cloudy night sky, the first non-human craft began to blur across the horizon. They flew low barely clearing the tree line and moved much faster than any jet, and yet it gave off no supersonic boom, didn't even make a sound. It moved forward in a strange, jarring manner, jumping from one point to another in a blur, then suddenly slowing down. I only caught a glimpse of the craft, a tangle of silver and gold filaments that formed a latticework across the massive body. It had the same kind of architecture as a spire as Agent Kellerson had described, being comprised of thin, curving strands that rose up and down the body of the craft. It glowed a soft blue, giving off a low, humming sound and emanating a smell like ozone and freon. Moving in a graceful arc, it flew across the town like a great golden dragon. Behind it, I saw three fighter jets furiously trying to catch up to the alien craft. They fired missiles, which sprouted fiery tails and raced across the sky, smashing into the back of the craft's body. A flash of light pierced the dark sky as the missile ignited, its bellowing explosion echoing over the hills. The craft came to a complete stop in the air, freezing in place as if a video had been paused. As the smoke and fire cleared, it hovered there, the blue aura still surrounding it, 
Its exterior totally intact. The fighter jets closed in on it, their engines screaming as they drew near. The blue light shimmered around the craft as it grew in size, forming a cloud that seemed to suck in the air around it. Jets of lightning began to burst out of the cloud, dozens of branching streams of energy that hit all three jets in an instant. Pieces of the planes exploded, flames leaping out of the shell. Then a second wave of lightning struck, and their planes dissolved into pieces. The clouds that surrounded the craft dissipated, blown away by the wind. Slowly, almost lazily, it started to move forward again, its strange engines humming, filling the destroyed town with the scent of ozone as the victors flew away. We continued on our way, trying to make good time. Alice had started complaining about her legs hurting after a couple of miles. Richie and I had tried taking turns carrying her, but she was simply too heavy to carry in the dark over a trail filled with roots and rocks that stuck up, trying to grab a foot like a catcher catching a baseball. Her legs had started to bleed again, and I could see a red spot where the stitches lay. This isn't good, Agent Kellerson said, as the girl limped farther behind. We might need to leave her. There's no way we're leaving her behind, Richie whispered angrily. If we don't get out of the town in three hours, we're all dead. You understand that, right? Should we sacrifice all of us for a girl? A girl who will die anyway if she's not out of town? He retorted. We, we don't know that they plan to kill us at the end of the time limit, I said, thinking of the strange tentacled faces that I had seen through the windows and glimpses of the white staring eyes behind the writhing appendages. I had seen them only for a moment, like a shooting star glimpsed out of the corner of my eye, but the intelligence contained in those orbs was undeniable. I looked back, checking on Alice. She lagged further behind than ever. I groaned, stopping to go check on her. I heard a rustle through the trees as I circled back, my heart leaping as I spun towards the noise, raising my rifle. Behind the bushes, though, I saw myself. I was wearing the same clothes, the same random hoodie Richie had given me. I had the same haircut, same shoes, everything, except the eyes weren't right. They gleamed with insanity, shone with a psychotic rage powerful enough to dissolve reality. Behind me, the other me, I saw the other members of my group scattered in the distance. Alice, Agent Kellerson, and Richie all standing behind trees or hiding behind bushes, peering out in the dim light that filtered through the brush. Alice had caught up with me now. She stood staring into the dark forest, her eyes filled with horror as she saw the doppelgangers. They were still as statues, with insane, rictus grins scarring every one of their faces. I remember the words of that tentacled abomination through the window. Even now, months later, he had said... We will keep the strong alive. I thought he meant the survivors, but something was knocked loose in my mind as I considered the vagueness of it. Perhaps he meant that they would keep the doppelgangers alive if they killed their originals. Maybe he meant the strongest of the two entities, one insane and fearless, one rational and human. I raised the gun to fire on my doppelganger and take him out of the equation for good when someone tackled me from behind. I went flying forward under the unexpected assault, my head smacking a tree as the wind was knocked out of my lungs. The gun went flying over my head and landed a foot away as I lay there, seeing stars and trying to breathe. In a dreamlike state, I saw Al's doppelganger approach me, reaching into the back of his pants for something. I breathed fast, willing myself to move, to go for the gun. My head swam and the world seemed dark. I felt blood dripping down my scalp, curving around my ears in small streams. Al pulled out a claw hammer, the sharp end already covered in blood and hair. He grinned at me. Time to get some work done, he said, in his old man's trembling voice, turning to me with the hammer raised. I heard yelling from Richie and Agent Kellerson as they turned and began to come back towards me, but they seemed so far away. I took a deep breath and as Al lunged at me with murder shining on his face, 
I raised my foot up and kicked him square in the crotch as hard as I could. His trajectory as he came down with the hammer didn't change much. I saw his eyes go wide with pain, but the sharp end of the hammer still whirred through the air towards my skull, his entire body following its path. I rolled away, hearing the hammer crash into the earth with a dull thud a moment later. Richie reached me then. He reached into his pocket and pulled out a small paring knife as he ran forward, something he must have grabbed from the kitchen before he left. As Al breathed hard on the ground next to me, his eyes unfocused and filled with pain, Richie brought the knife down in the middle of his throat. The entire blade disappeared, slicing through his flesh as easily as a diver slips through the skin of the water. He spasmed and kicked, choking on the blood as he inhaled. I heard a terrible groaning, sucking noise as he tried to breathe. Bright red artery fluid spurting in and out in time with his breathing, bubbling over the handle of the knife. He looked at me, still grinning, slowly reaching over as if he wanted to hold my hand. I had regarded myself by then, after what was probably a mild concussion, rolling onto my feet and grabbing the gun. I stood up slowly and shakily, feeling like I wanted to vomit. I looked into the woods, wanting to eliminate my doppelganger before he could kill me. Sometime during the struggle with Al, however, the whole group of them had disappeared. I could see panic spread through the group as I told them what Alice and I had seen. Agent Kellerson demanded his service rifle back immediately. This gun is government property, he said petulantly, like a child demanding a toy. It's mine by all rights. It's registered to me. You lost your right to the gun when you tried to kill me, I said, raising the barrel and putting it in his face. If you want it back, then try to take it. I dare you. Come get it. Richie got between the two of us, pushing us apart. Come on, guys. We got enough problems without killing each other. We're wasting time standing here arguing. The clock is running down quickly. He pulled his phone out of his pocket, checking the time. It's already been over two hours. We got a little less than an hour left until time runs out, and whatever they're planning to do comes about. I don't think we want to be anywhere near here when that happens. Alice continuously complained about the pain in her legs. She pulled her pants leg up to show me the angry red splotches that blossomed around the stitches. A small trickle of dark, almost black blood ran down her legs, and I saw it had already stained her pants on one side. We'll get you to a doctor as soon as we get out of here, but we have to keep going. We can't carry you the whole way. We reached a peak of the hill surrounding the town and began to descend. The next town over was in a deep valley, and we'd have to stumble down steep rock trails to get there. From a distance, I heard the screaming of many powerful engines. I looked up to see fighter jets passing overhead in a blur, breaking the sound barrier. I felt the sonic boom in my bones as it passed through my body, vibrating my chest. I involuntarily clamped my teeth down on my lip when it went past, drawing a thin line of blood. Their roar started to fade into the distance before being punctuated by multiple explosions. I saw flashes of light exploding from the center of town, like a second sun rising in the night. A mushroom cloud of black smoke rose high into the sky, mixing with the dark clouds above. That's not good, Agent Kellerman said, wiping sweat from his forehead as he stared dumbly back in the direction of the explosion. Why not? Alice asked keeping close to my side and limping heavily, trying to avoid her injured leg and wincing every time she put weight on it. Once they start the airstrikes, it means they've lost total control on the ground. You don't think they'd use nuclear weapons on it, do you? Richie asked. Agent Kellerman shook his head. No, that would raise too many red flags. Radioactivity gets out and spreads, and it's detected by people all around the world. That's how some people in Europe knew about Chernobyl's nuclear explosion even before the Soviet government announced it. No, they'd contain it with high-yield conventional explosions and artillery, and if that failed, they'd likely spray chemical weapons until the area became uninhabitable for hundreds of years. They have enough secret stockpiles to wipe out a hundred towns this size without making a dent. They might decide to drop nerve gas or cyclosarin from 
crop dusters and helicopters. When they do, we want to be as far upwind of the target area as we can get. What if we just get to the next town over and discover the same kind of craps going on over there? I asked, seeing a nightmarish vision of empty streets littered with murdered bodies. I think my will would have broken if I had arrived there and found it filled with psychotic twins, especially after the loss of my family and very likely the death of all my friends who'd lived nearby, except, of course, for Richie. Little did I realize at the time that some of our group would not see the next town. Within minutes, two of us would be dead. I was walking next to Richie, Alice, limping along in front of us, Agent Kellerson walking in the rear, continuously checking the trail behind us for signs of stalkers. I felt watched from all sides. I wonder what kind of fuel that craft runs on, Richie says. Hydrogen fusion, or antimatter, or maybe some kind of quantum state? We don't even know about yet. Actually, the government's reverse-engineered at least one of those crafts, Kellerson said. It had an outer shell composed of spinning substance called Bose-Einstein condensate, a type of superfluid that defies gravity. In the center, but we never got to hear about the engine. In a blur, two figures ran out of the bushes, wielding axes, dripping blood. With eyes bulging, I saw my doppelganger swing the axe down towards my head. I felt as if I saw it all in slow motion. I raised the automatic rifle and pulled the trigger. The recoil made the gun raise up high as a burst of gunfire shattered the nightmare silence. The bullet missed the doppelganger by mere inches, smashing into the tree a few inches above his head and raining splinters down on his hair and face. Realizing I'd run out of time, I tried to lunge to the side, but the axe caught me hard in the right shoulder. I felt it slice through my skin and shatter my collarbone. I fell back, arm going numb from the sudden shock of the brutal attack. As I landed on the ground, the wind getting knocked out of my lungs, I saw Agent Kellerson stumble back, the blade of an axe stuck in his forehead. He raised his hand to his spurting face, smacking his forehead as if he was trying to remember something important. His lips opened, gasping, his legs trembling before he fell forward the impact forcing the axe deeper into his skull. His murderer, his identical twin, lunged forward, wrenching at the axe, trying to pull it free. With every jerk to the left and right, more gouts of blood gushed out. Richie fought back against his doppelganger. I saw his lunatic twin raising a gleaming butcher's knife. Richie had his hands up in supplication, the small paring knife held loosely in one hand as he tried to back away. The doppelganger began to swing the blade wildly, two strokes slicing deep into Richie's chest. And then, Alice began to scream behind us. I turned to see her crawling away from the mayhem, a small silhouette crouched in the bushes only a few feet away, only the white, grinning teeth showing in the thick shadows of the brush, gleaming like some demonic Cheshire cat. As if stuck in a nightmare, I saw our group being slaughtered from all sides. Slowly, too slowly, I grabbed for the gun, seeing the flash of metal out of the corner of my eyes as my doppelganger came in for the killing blow. I raised the gun above my head at the last possible moment, bracing myself for the blow. The blade came down on the side of the gun, sending jarring vibrations through my body. My shoulder felt like it was nearly pulled out of the socket, but at least I was alive. I spun the barrel towards his face, pulling the trigger. It blew apart his cheek and nose, and for a moment, I saw into my own skeletal face, the grinning teeth half-blown to shards, as the figure swayed like a boxer before a knockout. Then he fell forward, landing heavily on top of me, covering me with my own blood and somehow familiar stickiness and smell emanating from it as it flowed out. I fought against the corpse, kicking and rolling, the dead weight of it pressed the gun down on my chest. I heard Alice's pained shrieks and, even more terrifying, nothing at all from Richie. As I rolled the corpse off myself, heaving with a sudden burst of energy, I realized I couldn't move or feel my right hand. I looked down and saw it, white and pale, laying as limp as a dead starfish. Using my left, I grabbed the gun, turning towards Agent Kellerson's doppelganger. I saw him standing over Richie's dead body, swinging the axe again and again into the meat of Richie's chest. 
Richie lay there, staring at me, his eyes wide and horrified, his eyes seeming to become black as his pupils dilated in death. With every blow of the axe, his body shook as if he were saying no. I shot the agent's doppelganger, my vision turning blurry for a moment. The burst of gunfire made my ears ring. With the shrieking tinnitus blurring into my head, I turned towards Alice. I saw two Alices, dressed in identical clothing, both covered in blood and cuts. They bit and grabbed at each other, and I had no idea what to do. Then I realized that one of the doppelgangers was missing. I heard the rustling of bushes directly behind me. In the top of my vision, I saw the knife coming down. I rolled, but it slammed hard into my white dead palm, pinning the numb hand to the ground as blood rushed up from the wound. With my other hand, I raised the gun and pointed it at the grinning figure of Richie. Without hesitation, I fired, opening up multiple holes in the center of his chest. I turned back to the Alice's, wondering what the hell I should do, but as I looked over, I found I was too late. One stood over the other, choking her, pinning her to the ground. The girl on top had blood seeping from her leg, and I had a surge of hope. That had to be the real Alice. The other one's face had turned purple, deepening and darkening into a sticky, suffocating shade, her lips turning blue. As she died, a wave of heat and light overtook us. An explosion rocked the earth moments later, shockwaves passing through the ground. I turned back to the town and saw a massive mushroom cloud rising high in the air. It seemed nothing was left of it. In front of the massive ball of fire and smoke that emanated from the center of town, a large blue cloud glimmered in the air. Soon I saw the alien craft speeding towards us in a blur, leaving the area that they had just obliterated. They came towards Alice and me, the ship hovering above the trees. Moments later, the humanoid skinned beings faded into existence in front of me. I just stood on the ground with a gushing wound and a dead hand, stunned and in agony. Alice looked no better. Covered in blood, her leg wound ripped open again, her face white and pale. She was breathing fast and trembled, looking like she might collapse. She stared at the three beings that manifested in front of us with a blank look on her face. You two are the last ones left alive, the one in front said, its bone white tentacles writhing like snakes. Behind the mass of tentacles on its face, I caught a glimpse of two intelligent round eyes pure white and lidless. They looked moist and glistened like opals, shining with color. Barely, I whispered. The being took out a strange black vial. With a reverent stance, he knelt down before me, cradling my head in his hand. Then he took some of my blood from the wound. He stood and walked over to Alice, repeating this strange ritual. Then he talked to the others in a weird guttural language with clicks and hisses mixed in randomly, the cadence fast and excited. He turned back to me. You are the survivors. You both are. You've proven yourself worthy. You are worthy of life. When the cleansing comes, the time of renewal, we will exterminate all life unworthy of it and start your people anew from the blood of the survivors. A second Adam and a second Eve. Perhaps this time they will actually be created in the image of God, the true God, ourselves. I saw at that moment that the two aliens behind him held small black canisters in their hands. One walked over to me and another walked over to Alice, spraying us both in the face. The world spun and my vision went black. I felt myself being lifted up before I was gone completely. I woke up in a hospital in the state capital. Alice was in the next room. We had no memory of how we'd got there and who had dropped us off. After all was said and done, I ended up losing most of my right arm in an emergency surgery. The injury from the axe wound had severed nerve endings and caused severe blood loss to the entirety of my limb. It had caused irreparable oxygen deprivation and permanent tissue death, too. The surgeon said I got to them just in time. But as the months passed, I felt I'd lost something more fundamental, something greater. 
I've been in contact with Alice's foster family, and they said she's acting strange, not talking. I wonder if I made a mistake. The entire experience was a nightmare, and I want to erase it from my memory forever. It led to the death of my family, my friends, and the crippling of my body. I can only hope that I never see those writhing bone-white tentacles again.